Welcome everyone to Christian Nationalism, Anti-Semitism, and Religious Freedom. My name is Katie Ryder, and I am the National Program Director for Jews for a Secular Democracy. We are thrilled you have joined us for tonight's webinar, which should last about an hour, give or take a few minutes. We will take questions for the panelists in the last 20 minutes or so. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box or in the chat if that's easier. Either way works. Tonight's webinar is part of our Jewish Women and Religious Freedom in Pittsburgh project, which is generously grant funded by the Jewish Women's Foundation of Greater Pittsburgh and underwritten by JWF trustee Nancy Weissman, thank you Nancy, in memory of her beloved mother-in-law JW, JWF trustee Jacqueline Weschler. We deeply appreciate all their support. We'd also like to thank all of our many and wonderful co-sponsors. I was going to read them, but we have so many, it, it, it will be a little bit too much. So they're right there on the graphic. And thank you to all of the co-sponsors for this program. In addition, I personally would like to thank all of the members of the Pittsburgh Steering Committee of this project, activists and leaders in Greater Pittsburgh, who have been instrumental in planning and running this project, including this webinar. If any of you in the Pittsburgh area are interested in joining, please drop me an email and I'll put my email in the chat uh, fairly soon. Okay, so I think we are gonna get started. It is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, Dr. Maria Carson. Dr. Carson, Director of Jewish Education and Arts at the JCC of Greater Pittsburgh, works with teens grades 6 to 12, providing educational, cultural, and social programming. Before working at the J, Dr. Carson was the Director of Jewish Life at Susquehanna University. She has taught college classes and religious school Hebrew high classes on Jewish philosophy, American Jewish thought, and gender and Jewish thought. She lives in Hazelwood with her husband, Dan, her two-year-old, Aliyah, and her ro robot vacuum, Robbie the Robot. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Maria Carson. The floor is yours, Dr. Carson. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for that great introduction. Um, I'm very happy uh, to be moderating this panel and excited to get the discussion rolling with our wonderful three panelists. Before I start and before I even introduce the panelists, I'm going to start with a quick sort of micro definition of what we mean in this space when we talk about religious freedom, because that in itself is a contested term right now. People tend to use it on all different sides of various debates and concerns. When we talk about religious freedom here, we mean that you are free in this country to participate in any kind of religious organizations you would like to, but also that the sort of state institution and the state apparatus itself does not privilege or associate with one particular religious organization. Um, so even though there are people who actually would prefer the state apparatus to be more aligned with Christianity, which we'll be talking about today, may talk about that in terms of religious freedom. That's not quite how we're using the term here. But now after getting that out of the way, um, just so that we're all on the same page about that, I'm really excited to introduce our panelists. So our panelists today are, as you know, Amy Spitalnik, Professor Kathleen Lee, and Pastor Tim Smith. So I don't want to take too much of our time because it's rather short today uh, talking about uh, with the introductions, but I do have some remarks to, to say about each of them. Our first panelist, Amy Spitalnik, is the CEO of the Jewish Council for Public Affairs, the national conven convener of Jewish coalitions working across communities to build a just and inclusive American democracy. She previously served as Executive Director of Integrity Fit First for America, which won its groundbreaking lawsuit against the neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and hate groups responsible for the Charlottesville violence. Under Amy's leadership, IFA became a powerful national voice in the fight against white supremacy, anti-Semitism, and extremism, and its Charlottesville case has emerged as a model for accountability. Amy also serves as a Senior Advisor on Extremism to Human Rights First, on the Advisory Board of the Polarization and Extremism Research and Innovation Lab, or PERIL, at American University, and on Bedrock's National Leadership Council. Amy frequently appears in national media and has been awarded various fellowships and honors, including being named a Woman in Power Fellow at the 92nd Street Y, a Truman National Security Project Fellow, a City and State 40 Under 40 Rising Star, and a New York Jewish Week 37, 36 Under 36 Changemaker. She graduated from Tufts University. 
Everyone, please welcome Amy Spitalnik. Our next panelist, Dr. Kathy Blee, Kath Kathleen Blee, excuse me, is a distinguished professor of sociology at the University of Pittsburgh. Professor Blee is one of our country's foremost experts on white supremacist, supremacist extremism and has written extensively on political movements of extremist white supremacy and anti-Semitism. Her most recent book, co-authored with Robert Futrell and Pete Simi, is Out of Hiding, Extremist White Supremacy and How It Can Be Stopped. Please welcome Professor Kathleen Blee. Our final panelist, Pastor Tim Smith, is a lifelong Pittsburgh resident, pastor of the Keystone Church of Hazelwood and CEO of Center of Life. He is affectionately known as PT, short for Pastor Tim. Pastor Tim, or PT, founded the Center of Life in an official capacity in 2001, though his roots in Hazelwood run deep and he's worked and volunteered in the community since the 1980s. His passion for connecting with kids and families led him to create Center of Life as a nonprofit and community empowerment organization. Pastor Tim brings a wealth of knowledge, compassion, and creativity from his education from Westinghouse High School, the University of Pittsburgh, and the Reformed Presbyterian Theological Seminary, and his professional experiences as an investment banker and National Youth Network Coordinator. Everyone, please welcome Pastor Tim and welcome all three of our amazing panelists um, who have um, different kinds of experience with this topic, and I'm really excited to ask them some questions and hear what they have to say. So. The first uh, question I have is for Dr. Blee, which is specifically about if there is a way to sort of define Christian nationalism and how Christian nationalism, as opposed to perhaps a more broader form of white nationalism, fits into the kind of ugly mosaic of uh, white extremist groups in this country. And also, what do you think Christian nationalism, how does this affect true religious freedom in this country. Thanks, Maria. Um, it, let me start with the definition. So in a nutshell, Christian nationalism is a broad and complicated movement that asserts that a particular vision of Christianity should craft public policy and civic life. In, in some form or another, Christian nationalism can really be traced back to the 1600s, the, the belief that the United States was founded with a mission and the mission was to spread white Protestant ideals in the face of what they perceived as threats from non-white people, non-Christian people, immigrants and indigenous peoples. It's bubbled up over American history, various periods, generally when at times when white Christians feel threatened by war, threatened by immigration, threatened by economic instability, and where they develop crusades essentially to, with the mission of regaining their earlier privileged position. I think it's also important to think about what Christian nationalism is not. It's not the same as evangelical Christianity. It, it's not the same as voting your values or wanting religion to play a part in public life. Christian nationalism is very different than what we think of as civic religion that blends spiritual ideas and political movements. Like famously Martin Luther King, who invoked the promises of the Declaration of Independence, or President Obama, who led the congregation in singing Amazing Grace at the funeral of a pastor murdered in the 2015 white supremacist inspired massacre at the Emanuel AME Church in Charleston. The difference between those ways of integrating religion and politics and Christian nationalism is that Christian nationalism asserts that this country was founded by quote, our people, white Protestants, for people like us, and that it should stay that way. So Christian nationalism is not really a political Christian movement. It's better seen as an authoritarian, anti-democratic movement that calls on Christians, white Christians, to claim power, or as they would say, dominion, in what they call the seven mountains of society. So Christians should be claiming dominion in government, in media, in business, in education, in arts and entertainment, 
in family, and in religion. Christian nationalism is a complicated movement, too hard to distill in a short paragraph, but I thought I would focus on a few aspects that don't receive much attention, but are really important. The first is that Christian nationalism is deeply rooted in a kind of Protestant evangelicalism that's based on shared identities and shared political convictions, not necessarily on religion. So think about that for a moment. It's, it's a religious movement that essentially is not that religious. Many commentators think of it as cultural Christianity, or sometimes it's called a para-Christian identity. That is, it's a movement that reflects and is based on a positive attitude toward evangelical Christianity, but that doesn't incorporate or demand allegiance to the customary beliefs and practices of Protestant evangelicalism. Now, that might seem really odd or surprising, but it's actually a strategic adaptation to the declining allegiance that white Protestant evangelicals in this society have for religious ideas and religious life. So survey after survey finds the same thing. A recent survey finds that more than a quarter of Protestant evangelicals never or seldom attend church, okay? These are people who are being recruited into Christian nationalism. They are Christian by identity, but they're not Christian in their practice, current practices. 43% of them in, in a recent survey said they don't even believe in the divinity of Christ. So we need to be careful not to think of Christian nationalism as just another religious reaction to a secular society. It's different than that. It's more than that. And it's much more dangerous in its goals and actions um, especially for people who are not white, who are not Protestant, who identify as other than cisgendered, who do not believe in male headship of families and social institutions, and those who believe in egalitarianism and a pluralist society. Okay. The second point is that Christian identity is highly nationalistic. And you, you see that expressed most vividly in frequent allusions that Christian nationalists make to the United States as God's chosen nation. God created this that this nation for white Christians. That's why white Christians need to lead it and defend it. But focusing on the ways in which it's so nationalistic can hide something really important which is the fact that it's increasingly transnational, it's increasingly international, with ties to far-right political parties and far-right movements in a number of countries across the world. So to take just one really current example, Christian identity has established itself and is gaining strength quickly in Germany where, like in other countries of Europe, its gains have been at the expense of the Christian democratic parties because Christian nationalism dismisses them as weak and accommodationist and presents itself as the vehicle for defending the Christian West, or what they would call the Occident, against what they would term the invasion of immigrants from African and Islamic dominant countries. Across the globe, we see the rise of Christian nationalism in pretty similar forms, in parties and movements that share an authoritative and, the and the um, theological vision, a theological vision without a religious base often, with no room for compromise. It's a movement that's girding itself, girding its adherence for an extremist spiritual warfare 
in which they are called by God to defeat their opponents, opponents who are generally referred to as demonic, as vermin, as not human, not simply as different or incorrect. Third, Christian, I, Christian nationalism, I think, is better understood as a fluctuating constellation of ideas and actions, not really a network or a set of groups or organizations or leaders. That's because its organizations and the players in this space come and go quickly. They change all the time. But we need to not, we need to pay attention to even as groups leave, others co come on. The movement continues to build even as its players and organizations fluctuate. So for example, Christian nationalism in today's US is blurred quite significantly into parts of the far right, in part because of its great adaptability to anti-Semitic Semitism and anti-Semitic ideologies. It's kind of blurry, fluid, morphing nature. It's very, you can't really sit down with a pencil and sketch out what Christian nationalism is, is and what organizations belong. They morph all the time. That also allows Christian nationalists to essentially have plausible deniability, to at the same time distance themselves and benefit from pretty infamous characters like Andrew Torba, who's the CEO of Gab, the racist friendly internet platform on which Pittsburgh's Tree of Life shooter engaged in violent, vicious, anti-Semitic conversations. And Torba now is currently preoccupied with the Christian nationalist ambition of trying to reshape the entire Republican party and evangelical churches that, in his opinion, have strayed off course by trying not to offend non-Christians. This constellation form of Christian nationalism also means when there's negative publicity around its associates, like Torba, or around its organi associated organizations, like the Heritage Foundation, whose Project 20 five, this detailed plan for essentially implementing a Christian nationalist informed vision of national leadership has attracted a lot of um, uh, negative feedback. Even in the face of that kind of negative feedback, even more radical agendas are constantly being curated by less visible actors and less visible organizations, such as for example, the Trump-aligned Center for Renewing America, really under the radar, but increasingly important. And fourth and finally, I think it's important to realize that Christian nationalism is involved in strategic actions. They're not just about talk. Some of their actions are directed or assisted or funded by major national founders and organizations like the Alliance Defending Freedom, the Christian legal group that was a leader in overturning Roe versus Wade. Others of its actions are generated locally with local leaders, especially attacks on marginalized and stigmatized populations, such as LGBTQIA persons, pregnant individuals, immigrants, and so forth, along with actions like book bannings and attacks on the so-called deep state. In that sense, Christian identity is particularly dangerous because it's operating, operating in a fashion that's not just top down and not just bottom up. It's actually doing both at the same time. Thank you very much, Dr. Blee. That was a really rich and wonderful uh, answer with a lot of things to chew on. Um, so now turning to Amy, um, you've written extensively about how anti-Semitism should not be quote unquote viewed in a silo um, and specifically how um, anti-Semitism can sort of animate other forms of hate and can, can sort of cause a broader rise in things like Christian nationalism on a more sort of general level. Can you speak a little bit towards that and the relationship between anti-Semitism and Christian nationalism? 
Absolutely. And, and first, thanks so much to, to Jews for a Secular Democracy for having us, um, Maria for moderating, and Katie and Paul. Um, and it's great to be here with Pastor Tim and with Kathy, who was a fantastic expert witness in our Charlottesville case, um, where a lot of these issues really were on full display in some of their slightly earlier forms in the current discourse, but I think in many ways really a precursor, a harbinger of the extremism that we've seen become so normalized in recent years. Um, so, you know, if folks take one thing from this conversation, and I hope they take a number of things from this conversation, I hope that it'll be that the fight for Jewish safety is the fight against broader anti-democratic extremism and hate, including and especially rising Christian nationalism right now. And so, too, is the fight for our democracy and for all communities' rights and safety, the fight against anti-Semitism. You can't separate these issues. They're inextricably linked. And until we fully understand and talk about them that way, we're not going to be able to effectively counter these threats. So I'll, I'll take a few minutes to explain why. I think we all understand anti-Semitism when it operates like so many other forms of religious, racial, or ethnic hate or prejudice. Right? Hating Jews because of who we are, or what we look like, how we practice our religion, or we don't how we don't practice our religion. Um, or simply because we're Jews. But what's unique about anti-Semitism is that it also operates as this pernicious, insidious conspiracy theory rooted in lies about Jewish power and influence that are then used to ultimately sow distrust in our democracy, paint institutions and communities as pawns of Jewish control, pick communities against one another in a way that we know is so deeply dangerous. And that in turn can really fuel hate and extremism targeting not just Jews, but our institute or democratic institutions and so many other communities. And in turn, as we see our democracy deteriorate, as we see these attacks on our democratic norms and values, as we have increasingly so in recent years, we know that anti-Semitism only continues to flourish in a way that threatens, again, not just the Jewish community, but so many others. Um, and at at the end of the day, it's really important to understand how this anti-Semitism, these conspiracy theories, fuel and animate broader extremism, frankly advancing so many of the very policies and ideas that are at the, co at the core of a far-right extremist Christian nationalism. Kathy talked about Project 2025. There are a few things that sort of better illustrate precisely what we're talking about here than so many of the policies that are um, that are delineated in Project 2025 at this moment. It's sort of the perfect encapsulation of how it's manifesting right now from a political perspective. And it's also similarly important to understand that this deep connection between not just these dehumanizing dangerous policies, but actual political violence and broader extremism. Research from the University of Chicago, ADL and others tells us that there's a deep connection between belief in anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and broader threats to our democracy. Belief in conspiracy theories like the Great Replacement Theory, which I'm sure um, we'll talk about at length, which argues that there is a Jewish effort to replace the white race or the white electorate with black and brown people and others. Um, belief in those sorts of conspiracy theories are among the best predictors of belief in, uh, in, in the efficacy of political violence and anti-democratic extremism. If you buy into those conspiracy theories, you are disproportionately likely to believe that political violence and broader violent extremism is a valuable tool and actually engaging. And similarly, belief in conspiracy theories is among the best predictors of anti-Semitism. So we see how this all sort of works together in this feedback loop in which anti-Semitic conspiracy theories are driving broader political extremism, belief in the efficacy of violence, and in turn, that reinforces some of these conspiracy theories, which in turn reinforce anti-Semitism. And I wanna talk about a few specific ways in which we're seeing this feedback loop operate between anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and ideas and very specific dangerous policies that are ultimately rooted in many Christian nationalists and other far-right extremist ideas. We talked about the Great Replacement, right? the idea that Jews are seeking to orchestrate the replacement of the white race um, through support for immigrants, refugees, black and brown people. And we're seeing this not just in you know, Nazis chanting Jews will not replace us in Charlottesville, which was horrifying at the time seven years ago, 
but increasingly so normalized in our day-to-day -day political rhetoric. We hear it from elected officials and other politicians. We hear it in increasingly mainstream media, this invasion and replacement rhetoric. And it's not just fueling dehumanizing policies targeting immigrants and refugees and other communities, but it's also directly fueled the cycle of violence. Charlottesville, Pittsburgh, which was the deadliest attack on the Jewish community on US soil, Poe attack, El Paso, which targeted the Latino and immigrant community in Texas, the Buffalo attack, which targeted the black community in New York, and so many others. And so we see how these anti-Semitic conspiracy theories are directly fueling um, attacks on not just Jews, but so many others. Similarly, we hear it in um, the language of election deniers who argue that there's an effort to steal the election and are using it to advance dangerous dehumanizing policies targeting black voters and others. We see it in the neo-Nazis and other extremists who are recruiting off of anti-LGBTQ events, anti-trans, anti-drag events, similarly rooted in a lot of these dangerous dehumanizing policies, in conspiracy theories about birth rates that are used to advance anti-abortion agendas, in book and curriculum bans that go after any teaching of slavery or white supremacy or LGBTQ issues or even Holocaust issues. And I also want to specifically note the ways in which in a post-October 7th world, we've seen some of these conspiracy theories related to Jewish and Zionist power and influence creep into other spaces in which we're hearing of efforts to ban or boycott Jews or Zionists from certain academic, literary, art, or other spaces, and ultimately separate Jews from the very pro-democracy and anti-hate coalitions we need to be building right now to counter this rise in extremism. And so, all of this feels very dire, right? We, we, we know we are living at a time of increasingly normalized extremism and hate that has pervaded our politics and our media and our society in a new way. So what do we actually do about this? We, we need to start thinking about the conversation on anti-Semitism in America, less so in the myopic way that we so often have. We treat it at this, as this particularist phenomenon that um, needs to be treated in a silo, when in fact we know that it is inextricably linked with the fight for democracy and the fight for the rights and safety of so many others. And what this does by treating it in a silo, it not only prevents non-Jews from understanding their own self-interest in combating anti-Semitism, it makes it harder for Jews to see democracy and civil rights work as fundamental to our safety, and ultimately, it keeps our communities apart at a time when we know that building cross-community coalitions and solidarity against anti-democratic extremism, hate, white Christian nationalism, and so much more has never been more urgent. So what do we do? Instead of leaning into these, this increasingly siloed way we are treating hate, we need to break out of it. We need to understand that the only way we are going to effectively fight anti-Semitism in this moment is to take on the broader anti-democratic extremism and other forms of hate it's deeply interconnected with. And so too must the fight against broader hate and extremism and for democracy take on anti-Semitism. There's some good news here. This is not only accurate in terms of what the reality tells us. We, we know that in fact, this extremism tends to fuel and animate other, and other extremism. The research tells us that the most effective way to actually engage people in this work, to engage them in the fight against anti-Semitism or broader hate and extremism, is to help them understand their own stake in this fight, to tell the story of how deeply interconnected hate is with all of our safety and our democracy. And so there's a path forward here, which is one that recognizes the deep interconnection of Jewish safety with the rights and safety of others. Um, this is some of the work that we're beginning to do at the Jewish Council for Public Affairs, where we recently launched new action networks focused on protecting our democracy and countering hate and extremism, specifically working on so many of the issues we talked about here, not just countering anti-Semitism, but countering anti-Black racism and white supremacy, Islamophobia, anti-LGBTQ hate, anti-immigrant hate, standing up for voting rights, countering disinformation and extremism, fighting book and curriculum bans because we know that these issues are inherent not just to the rights and safety of our neighbors and the right thing to do from a Jewish values perspective, but actually fundamental to protecting Jewish freedom and safety in this, uh, in this country as well. So it's gonna take all of us. Um, how we actually move forward here is to break out of these silos and to recognize the deep inextricable link of these issues 
um, so that we're that we're no longer treating anti-Semitism as a particular challenge and Christian nationalism as a particular challenge and anti-Black racism as a particular challenge, and rather see that the fight is going to require all of us coming together and building the sorts of coalitions necessary to take on this this rising threat. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, so our last intro question is for Pastor Tim Smith. And we, Dr. Blee sort of mentioned sort of the difference between Christian nationalism and Christianity. Um, but if you could say more as a Christian leader yourself, Pastor Tim, about that, and also why does Christian nationalism affect everyone? We heard some of this also from Amy, but specifically, why should Christians care about Christian nationalism? Um, and why should Christians care about anti-Semitism? Well, again, thank you for, for having me here with uh, these two very fine <laughs> panelists here. And I've really enjoyed what I've heard so far. Uh, and also, hello to my fellow Hazelwoodian. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me just start off by saying, you know, most mainstream, mainstream Christians would not ascribe to uh, Christianity as something that people must be a part of. But, but in turn, as something that people may be a part of, there are a few prevailing themes that run through our scriptures, uh, like faith, hope, love being three of them, but love being the greatest of these themes. This means God's love for humanity and huma humanity's love for each other. Implicit in that message of love is freedom. Now, in the scriptures, there is a message of love that brings salvation, and there is a there is freedom to accept or refuse or search out the truth or viability of that message. The beauty in those choices is significant in the fact that we as humans beings from our earliest days are searching for something that's much greater than what our eyes can see or our hearts and minds can imagine. And in many cases, a lot of things that we're looking for are even greater than the religious or the religion that we practice because we're humans. Now, Christian nationalism seeks to legislate religion. This puts it in, in, in some categories as organizations that want to exercise power and control over certain groups of people. Um, once you once once a law is put in place, the way our our systems work, once a law is put in place, it automatically takes away freedoms from one group and gives power and control to another group. Unfortunately, it it works like that a lot of times. Not on every law, but on some laws. And so, Christian, uh, you know, the Christian faith engages people in religious practice that are rooted in having a personal relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. This means we practice our religion, but we live our faith. Therefore, when Christian nationalism attempts to legislate how we practice our religion, it intends to redirect our faith as well. Now, this matters this matters because, and it should matter to, to Christians, and I think it should matter to everyone, because um, in, in, this, in this time when the, 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 this country was founded, freedom of religion was part of the original intent. Christian nationalism seeks to take away freedoms of religion because it seeks to define both what we believe and how we practice that belief. It seeks to do that by just almost any means necessary. And I think I really like what Dr. Blee mentioned when, when she said that Christian nationalism kind of goes, you know, the, the folks that are involved in that just kind of go from one spot to the next spot to the next spot and whatever, whatever fits, whatever fits for a little while. When it doesn't fit anymore, they got to go somewhere else. There's no real place. But one of the things that I think a lot of, a lot of the beginning thinkers of all of this great experiment that is America did not think about in the very early years was the evolution of human beings, was the fact that we had, we are evolving, that we are not the same people <laughs> today that we were way back then. 
and the, the the doors that have been opened and the relationships that have been built and the understandings that have come forth, uh, all of those things are prevailing now more and more until groups are coming together so that organizations like or people that are involved in Christian nationalism, their voices are getting smaller and smaller, even though it seems like what we see out there are groups that are similar to that. I think that I think that those voices are getting smaller and smaller because I think that the voices of groups like uh, our Jewish brothers and sisters, uh, many of our Muslim brothers and sisters, our Christian brothers and sisters, on and on, you know, uh, are coming together to say, you know what, no. And you know, one other scripture that I want to I want to bring up that would not be a good scripture for Christian nationalists. But but I do believe that they they quote it from time to time. Is 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 John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever be believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. When we talk about the whosoever piece, that would not fit with Christian nationalism, because whosoever would include me. It would include uh, it would include Amy. It would include Doctor Blee. It would include you know it would include too many people. And so I think that I think that you know when we are when we are going at this and and when we're um, when we have to combat it from a political standpoint a lot of times uh, I just wanted to want to back up a little bit too because there's one other thing I wanted to mention in some of the early African American churches in the South there were uh, there were churches that did not believe in you know instruments didn't believe in music didn't having any kind of instruments or anything in, in, in their churches. But they also had a congregational book. And in that congregational book uh, were, were, you know, congregational sayings and, and chants and different things that, that they would say during the course of their service. But nowhere in, in that book was any mention of freedom. Nowhere in that book. These were Black churches that, even though they were all Black, they were led by white men. And um, and this is the kind of thing that really Christian nationalism uh, would would um, would support, uh, and and I think that you know, I think that th that that's one of the reasons why I think that this this conversation is so important because we we have we still have this element that is lurking around in uh, in several different areas. But I do think it goes from place to place. I don't think it can really settle. And um, and I think that I think that the uh, I'll put it like this. I'll kind of end my saying, but by right now we are not being overcome with evil, but we are overcoming evil with good, and that good is a big part of what you're doing here right now through this conversation. Thank you. Well, I hope we can, you know, in, increase good in, in in the world by having this conversation. Um, I'm going to start asking some questions from the audience, sort of synthesizing some. I have some other questions here. I did want to just mention, um, this was in the chat, this this organization that's putting this on, Jews for Secular Democracy, uh, is a 501c3. Um, so we cannot, in programming like this or in other you know, written material, we don't support particular candidates. So sometimes if it seems like we're kind of swerving away from particular questions that have to do with particular candidates, you are not incorrect. <laughs> that is in fact by design. Um, but I am sure hopefully we can help you get some answers um, for that um, on a more casual basis. Uh, but the first question is actually um, sort of, there's two sort of interlinked questions and I'm going to throw them both together and hopefully it's not too confusing. One is, what is the end goal for a lot of Christian nationalists, particularly because as we've learned, a lot of them may not actually behave in particularly Christian ways. So do they, how would, do they want society to function if maybe they don't want to go to church every Sunday? Um, the other question is also about identity, which I think kind of relates to this question. Maybe it doesn't so well, but it has to do with how Christian nationalists seem to think European descended Jews are not white. Um, and what's that all about? Because in larger American community, in the larger American community, European descended Jews are often considered white. Um, and also where do Jews of color um, and 
sort of non-white passing Jews, we might say, um, Middle Eastern Jews, Black Jews, that sort of thing, where do they fit into this? Um, does anti-Semitism and Christian nationalism press upon them in a slightly different way? Um, yeah, so I guess those are two pretty qu different questions, but if anyone would like to answer either one or both, that would be great. The floor is open. Oh, I'll just uh, I'll just start off. I'll just say that I think the I would think that the end goal is is to purge uh, pretty much every system or fill just about every system with people who uh, who take on the white supremacist mentality, and um, and also who would uh, continue to oppress. Uh, people of color and uh, push laws that are uh, unfair, uh, as well as never allow the constitution uh, that this constitution language that supports uh, people of color or Jews uh, to protect them and to give them the rights that they need. Uh, they would continue to suppress those things that are part of the constitution, the amendments that are there. And, um, and so I think that I think it's really at the end of the day, it's of course it's 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 a broad answer, but it's power and control over everything. Yeah, and to take on the the second pieces of of those questions, I mean, I wholly agree that ultimately the goal here is to to have dominance over a society by removing or marginalizing those who don't fit into the very narrow vision for what this society should be. And ultimately, I think we need to understand it as the end of democracy and the end of any sort of multicultural, multiracial, multi-faith society. Um, but specifically on the questions of, of how Jews are perceived, look, I think uh, many Jews, myself included, are white by sort of outward facing appearances and by our standards um, if you ask a white supremacist, if you ask a white nationalist, they wouldn't agree. Um, and uh, it, there's, uh, I, I know Kathy can speak at length about some of the, the history here and has written about it, I think, including uh, in, in our Charlottesville trials, including uh, testifying to, to some of this in your, in your written testimony. Um, and it makes it all the more complicated and, and challenging, partially because it, it's confusing to people, right? And I think particularly in this moment, the ways in which anti-Semitism doesn't fit neatly into understood uh, parameters of race and power in this country, right? It, it makes it much harder to understand anti-Semitism when it's manifesting because Jews are, I carry privilege walking down the street that many other people don't. I'm a non-Orthodox white Jewish woman. So I'm not facing the same sort of discrimination or potential uh, attacks on the street that either a person of color might face or an Orthodox Jew might face. Um, and yet, if you ask, again, if you ask a white supremacist, because I am a Jew, I am fundamentally not white. Um, and so uh, it, it it complicates the dynamics of race and power that so often drive how we understand these things. Um, and it particularly so because the Jewish community is also incredibly diverse. And so when we think about the ways in which anti-Semitism fuels and animates other forms of hate and vice versa, we need to particularly understand that there are Jews of color, LGBTQ Jews, immigrant and refugee Jews, and others who then face compounding forms of hate um, and marginalization um, in different ways. And so it's deeply messy, deeply complicated. Um, and that's really the goal of, of these extremists to fundamentally pit our communities against each other um, and otherwise um, in a way that um, we know has, has deep ramifications. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Dr. Blee, do you have any comments on that or? Um, let me just, um address the, your first question just a little bit more. So Christian nationalists don't necessarily want to impose a religious framework. They mm -hmm. want to ensure the power of people who come out of that culture and identity as white Protestants. So that, that's an identity that, that adheres 
whether or not the person's practicing Protestantism, but it, people who come out of that privileged space want to ensure their continuing privilege, basically. So it's a, it's a privilege driven, not specifically religious or spiritual driven agenda. Thank you. So there were a couple questions that I think are sort of pointing to how anti-Semitism is often sort of feeds into conspiracy theories. Um, and one question was, why does anti-Semitism tend to increase in times of economic instability or other forms of instabilities? And do you think that's just primarily because of anti-Semitism's long history with conspiracy theories and because, you know, people don't like feeling confused or unsure about the world? Um, or do you think there's perhaps other reasons in why anti-Semitism and other forms of bigotry seem to become more animated during unstable economic times or in times of political strife? This is for I, guess, I can start, but I suspect others will have thoughts on this. Well, look, first and foremost, in, in times of, of of challenge or of strife, whether it's the COVID pandemic or, you know, right now all of the conversations around immigration or, or you know, the, the 2020 election. And all, when people are looking for someone to blame for something, you're going to find a scapegoat. And so often Jews have, have been the scapegoat. What's unique about anti-Semitism, and I, start, I spoke about this briefly earlier, is that it doesn't operate like other forms of hate because it is also rooted in these conspiracy theories and tropes around Jewish power and control. It's not simply punching down to people because you think that they're less than, that they're uh, less than from a racial perspective or ethnic perspective or otherwise, that they're fundamentally less worthy as human beings, although it's oftentimes that as well. It's also, as, as Deborah Lipstadt, who's the U.S. ambassador to, um, to uh, counter anti-Semitism talks about, it's about punching up because Jews are per perceived to have power, to have clout, to have capital, to have resources. And you hear it in these conspiracy theories, for example, related to George Soros and his supposed control of everything from immigration to the electorate, to uh, our government, to the banking system, Rothschilds, right? These globalist cabals, you hear it in this language. And so anti-Semitism isn't simply this idea of treating people differently because you think they're less than you. It's actually this idea of punching up to the people you're perceive, perceiving to be in control, to have the power, to have the resources, to have um, the, the money uh, and the, and the, the, the tools to fundamentally change things. And that's why we saw during, for example, the COVID pandemic, pandemic and the Goyam Defense League, which is this neo-Nazi extremist group, planting all of these flyers and other extre vile extremism related to G the Jewish COVID conspiracy theory, the Jews behind COVID. Of course, there was also the anti-Asian hate that came alongside it, um, because so often this is intertwined. It's why you see it, as we've been talking about, in the anti-immigrant conspiracy theories, where Jews are the puppet masters controlling immigrants, caravans of migrants coming up through the southern border where Jews are the puppet masters orchestrating Black voters and others to show up and steal the election, um, whatever it might be. And so it really speaks to these age old tropes and conspiracy theories that are simply just manifesting in a new way related to the political environment we're in right now. But there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to anti-Semitism. It's these same tropes and conspiracy theories that have been part of this for generations, for millennia, that are just now being repackaged and repurposed in a way um, to advance these dehumanizing policies and broader extremism that we're talking about here. Thank you, Amy. Any additional thoughts, Pastor Tim or Dr. Blee? And so right if the answer is no. I, I would just say that power and control has manifested itself in it's just multiple ways uh, during the course of, of the, the existence of this country. Uh, power control has worked its way through pretty much every every system. What we have seen, when I say we, I'm talking about in the Black church in particular, what we have seen uh, 
is is power and control and how it impacts people within our churches, how it impacts uh, the schools within the communities where our churches sit, uh, how those schools a lot of times are closed and uh, how there's issues around, you know, books that kids can read and books that kids can't read, you know, all of those kinds of things. And, you know, I, I, I trace that kind of back to this whole idea of, you know, white supremacy, uh, as well as just, you know, this, this idea of, of Christian nationalism, like everything being, everything being the same, you know, or everything, everyone being in the same religion kind of thing. But so you can marginalize me. If I get, if I get up under your umbrella, you can marginalize me. You can do whatever you want to do to me, you know, uh, because I'm under your control. Um, and, you know, I, I just think that it, we've, we're seeing it in so many of our systems now. We're seeing that this, this whole idea of, of divide and conquer, it's the same thing, but it's just it's the same leftovers warmed over, but it 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 and it doesn't it 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 doesn't stop. And I think that the the idea for us, you know, when I mentioned earlier about us, the way we come together, the way we are coming together, the way you see more and more of that, you know, that is the to me that that's the thing that <clears throat> fuels uh, the 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 tool of defeat for something like you know, anti-Semitism or Christian nationalism. When we continue to come together, even though, you know, you can't divide it. Now you can't divide in Congress anymore because we won't be divided, you know, and if we're not divided, we won't be conquered. And um... Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, well, moving on, um, I have one final question. Um, and a lot of the questions in the chat have been sort of like, oh, I'm so concerned about the rise in Christian nationalism. I'm so concerned about sort of the threats to our democratic institutions. How, where do we go from here? And we've heard a lot of really important stuff in this panel already about the importance of seeing forms of hate as interconnected and sort of the importance, sort of the beginnings of a conversation of the importance of interfaith and intersectional work. But I'm sort of wondering if each of the panelists can think about one sort of discrete action item that people could do today, could walk away with today as a way to like how they could think about um, helping to fight against this wave of Christian nationalism. Um, even if that is just like continue to view anti-Semitism as connected with other forms of racism. Or if it's something like, I actually think, you know, writing so-and-so might be helpful or something like that. Um, but sort of one to two discrete tasks that people could do or places to learn more about these topics would also be appropriate. So that is up for the panel. I have a minor suggestion, so I'll start. Um, Pastor Tim and Amy gave such great um, sort of big picture ideas of how to move, but my suggestion is we should figure out ways to not let Christian nationalism operate under the label Christian. It's one of the most normalizing words. It, I mean, both of those words, Christian and nationalism, are words that have a positive value to most people. And they also have kind of a politically innocuous uh, meaning. So what they, What the use of that term does is really normalize what's quite an extremist movement. Um, at the same time, it makes it invisible. It, it makes invisible what's actually really happening. So I think the strategy is really exposure and going after some of the fundamentals of this complicated movement, particularly the use of Christian. Thank you. I totally agree with that. I, I will add very specifically, I think understanding that the one of the best ways we can all fight extremism, including Christian nationalism or whatever we're going to call it after we rebrand it to something that's more understandable, um, is to actually invest in our, in our democracy and our democratic institutions. 
and build democratic resiliency. And we can do this in a variety of ways, right? There's a litany of policies and I would encourage folks to check out our website at JCPA, where through our action networks, we're mobilizing for a number of these policies, media and digital literacy to counter disinformation, voting rights, including not just the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act on the federal level, but state voting rights acts as we continually see efforts to um, claw back fundamental voting rights for immigrants, for LGBTQ rights, um, investing in a whole of society and whole of government approach to countering hate fueled violence, including anti-Semitism, but so many other forms of hate. But what we can all do over the next two months, and we can do this through a five as, as a 501c3, is we can get out the vote. We can make sure that all of us vote and that each and every eligible voter that we know can vote. And particularly those of you who are in states where there have been a lot of shenanigans to pull people off the voting rolls and otherwise make it that much harder for people to vote. It's now that you need to be checking your voter registration and making sure that you are on those rolls and eligible to get to the polls uh, through early voting or on election day. And so if you go to our website, jewishpublicaffairs.org slash vote, we have a campaign called Chutzpah to Vote. I'm sure many others um, here are also involved in GOTV and voter engagement and education efforts, which 501c3s can and should do um, in election years to make sure people know how they can vote, where they can vote, um, and what's on the ballot. Um, and so I'd encourage folks to um, make sure that at least right now you are doing everything in your power to vote yourself, to make sure everyone you know votes, um, and then more broadly mobilize through JCPA, through Jews for a Secular Democracy, through any of your other partners for these specific other pro-democracy policies that will fundamentally keep our community safe and fight back against the normalization of these ideas and uh, extremist conspiracy theories that we're seeing. I think on a personal level, I think on a personal level, it would really be good if we all looked at, you know, whether you are a Christian or or a Jew or Muslim or what, whatever, whatever you're into, but look at where, where you are, look at where you worship. Think about the people that you're worshiping with and 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 ask yourself, do you see any traces of Christian nationalism? You know, is it impossible for it to be in your congregation? I would say no. Um, I would say that mentality, and I agree with Dr. Glee, that we shouldn't even use the term Christian to describe it because uh, it's there's nothing Christian about it. And so um, I would say on a personal level that we begin to examine our own environments, our own uh, circles of influence, and that we would uh, begin to think about how we uh, actively uh, engage with that and deal with that in our own circles of influence because, because it can hide in plain sight. And then also, uh, also think about the company that we keep and think about how powerful it would be if we if we changed the way we, you know, the 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 people that we build relationships with. You know, a lot of times we don't we don't come together because we just simply won't come together and we just simply have all of these different thoughts about each other that uh, we're conditioned to believe. And it keeps us separate. You know, when we talk about people going to their places of worship, that seems to be the most segregated time still in America. And there's a reason for that. And uh, and I think that is also a tool that uh, can be used uh, to cause divide and conquer to happen uh, in our, in a, even, in, even in our per very personal congregations. So I, I would I would suggest that we we take a closer look uh, because uh, some of these things are absolutely closer than we think. Thank you. Um, I'd like to turn it back over to, to Katie for our, our goodbye. And this has been such an educational and uplifting um, experience for me. So thank you so much for allowing me to be your, your moderator today. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Maria. I really appreciate it. And I have so many questions that I still want to get to, but, but, you know, we try to keep this as close as possible to an hour for everyone. Um, I, I want to thank again, you, Dr. Maria Carson, our amazing panelists, Amy Spitalnik, Professor Kathleen Blee, Pastor Tim Smith, you all were amazing and I think gave all of us much to think about. Um, I also want to thank again all of our co-sponsors and particular, particularly 
Um, this project sponsor, the Jewish Women's Foundation of Greater Pittsburgh, we absolutely could not have done this without um, your support. The Jewish Women and Religious Freedom Project in Pittsburgh has two more events coming up, a webinar in October between the holidays on religious freedom and LGBTQ plus rights, and an in-person half-day conference in mid-December. I believe we're going to go with December 15th in Pittsburgh. So please look for more information on these events coming soon. In addition, uh, JFASAD has two upcoming webinars this month related to what we were just talking about. On September 19th at 7 p.m., Project 2025, Christian Nationalism and American Jews, What's at Stake? With Rabbi Columnist and CNN contributor Jay Michelson. And... On September 30th, Amendment 139, dragging Arizona abortion rights into the 21st century. Registration information for both of those webinars will be going out very, very shortly. Again, thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Dr. Carson, for moderating. Thank you to the steering committee and to our sponsors. And good night, everyone. Thank you for coming. Have a wonderful night.